This is CBC Here and Now. They're dissatisfied with their life in these urban environments. The rural population is plummeting, so why are young people packing up and moving to Outport, Newfoundland? Failure to stop the spill. Hibernia is ordered to pay up. Because, like, you're basically pushing to pass your limit. Put down the iPad. 900 young runners are racing through Pippi Park. Gobble, gobble, gobble. Thanksgiving long weekend is here. The forecast looking pretty good to get out and enjoy. Though some showers sandwiched into Sunday. The full forecast is coming up. We start tonight with breaking news. Emergency crews are on the scene of another deadly crash on Veterans Memorial Highway near Bay Roberts. Yes, and that's where here now is Terry Roberts is right now. So Terry, what can you tell us? Uh, yes, Carolyn, I can tell you that Veterans Memorial Highway is now reopened to traffic. It just opened about five minutes ago. That's after uh, crews cleared up what was another grim scene here on this highway. I'm at the intersection right here to North River and about a half a kilometer over my shoulder, there's a bend in the road and it was there today at around 2.30 where two cars, two smaller cars, a Kia and a Hyundai collided head on at around 2.30. Now the car driving north, uh, the female driver of that car, a 42 year old woman from Bay Roberts, uh, the RCMP tells me was uh, she died in that collision today, 42 years old from Bay Roberts. Now her passenger, also a female, uh, received minor injuries, we're told, and she's been taken to hospital. There was a second vehicle, a vehicle tra traveling north towards uh, the Trans-Canada Highway. The male driver of that car was also taken to hospital uh, with uh, undisclosed injuries. We don't have any information on that right now. And a third vehicle also came up on the scene and uh, was involved uh, but sustained only minor damages and no uh, injuries in that. Uh, so the latest is right now that this highway has uh, reopened. There for several hours traffic was being detoured through North River and Mackinson's, uh, but that's now uh, over and the RCMP tell us they do not know the cause of this crash. But what we do know is that this is the latest deadly incident on this roadway. Just uh, less than a month ago on September the 11th, three people died in a similar crash, a head-on collision uh, further south of here near the intersection to Roach's line. Now all of this is occurring as this road has uh, been in the spotlight now for a number of weeks. People in this area saying it's a dangerous highway. They've been calling for uh, improvements including passing lanes and the provincial government seems to be listening. Transportation Minister Steve Crocker announced uh, not too long ago that he's going to hold consultations in this area this fall to talk about what can be done but uh, and the numbers uh, not good. Uh, this uh, today marks another grim milestone where 30 people now, according to numbers we've been tracking, have died on our highways so far this year. Now that's within uh, range of what we've seen in previous years, but what's notable is that most of those, all but seven, have occurred since August the 1st. So this uh, crash right here is cleaned up right now, but the grieving for a family in Bay Roberts area has only just begun. Debbie? Well, thanks very much, Terry, and we will continue to monitor this story on our website. In other news, CBC has learned the Newfoundland and Labrador Credit Union has taken possession of a controversial condominium complex built by a company partly owned by Premier Dwight Ball. Documents show the bank has taken control of 33 unsold units in the Sundara. Other documents show the Premier and his business partners signed a $10 million guarantee for the development in April of 2014. Here and now's Fred Hutton has that story. This is the Sundara, a 45-unit condominium complex located on the west end of Black Marsh Road in Mount Pearl. When Dwight Ball and his business partners in Rockmount Properties built this development six years ago, each condominium was listed at between $275,000 and $285,000. But in a struggling economy, only 12 of the units sold, and the owners decided to convert the building to an assisted living complex. That idea hit a snag when two residents appealed Mount Pearl's decision to grant the permit. And opposition members in the House of Assembly cried foul over a perceived conflict because of the Premier's connection to the building and the fact that at the time, Eastern Health was closing long-term care beds. For months, residents were in the dark about the future of Sundara, but now at least know who is controlling the 33 unsold units. 
This week, they received notice that the Newfoundland and Labrador Credit Union has taken possession of the property. When asked about this latest development, the Premier issued a statement to CBC News saying, quote, Obviously, I'm disappointed with the news, but this is the type of sacrifice people have to make when they come into public life. Ball also stressed that while it's disappointing, he had nothing to do with any of the decisions because his private business holdings are now in a blind trust. Ball's business interests may be in a blind trust, but documents filed with the Provincial Registry of Deeds show that in April of 2014, he and his business partners with Rockmount gave personal guarantees to the credit union for a mortgage of more than $10 million. The current status of those guarantees is unknown. This week, the Regional Appeal Board met for a second hearing about granting a building permit to convert this complex to assisted living, but it was put over to a later date. It might all be a moot point now because Trask and Ball are out. The same letter from the credit union to condo owners here this week advised them that Carol Burke Realty is now managing this property. As for the future of the Sundara, residents here hope to find out more information when they meet with credit union officials next week. Reporting from Mount Pearl, Fred Hutton, CBC News. Hibernia has been ordered to pay a quarter of a million dollars in connection with an offshore oil spill in 2013. The spill happened over two days in December while oil was being pumped from the platform to a tanker. In provincial court today, Hibernia Management and Development was found guilty of failing to ensure there was no risk of pollution. They were fined $80,000 and ordered to pay $170,000 into an environmental fund. The company says it's taken action to address what caused the spill. There's a new development in the murder case against Graham Vitch. There are now strong indications that Vitch's lawyer will argue the 19-year-old was not criminally responsible for the death last year of pharmacist David Collins. Vitch appeared in provincial court this morning waiving his right to a preliminary hearing. And that means the case will now go straight to Supreme Court with a trial before a judge and jury. Lawyer Mark Rushi would not say how he plans to defend Vitch against a first degree murder charge, but he offered strong hints. Mr. Rich has been having a very difficult time in a complex way. I don't want to get into the details of that, but uh, suffice to say it transcends normal emotional stress, which I think is obvious to anyone who's been paying attention. Questions surrounding Vitch's well-being have surfaced during his court appearances. Vitch is accused of killing pharmacist David Collins at a house in Logie Bay last December. Collins was in a romantic relationship with Vitch, Vitch's mother. He's now expected to be arraigned in Supreme Court next month. The lawyer for convicted rapist Sofian Bolag says his client should not be declared a dangerous offender. At provincial court today, Jeff Brace said Bolag doesn't reach that threshold. Here and now's Glenn Payette explains. Today, Sofian Bolag's lawyer Jeff Brace said the defense should not be held accountable for re-victimizing the two women and the teenager Bolag raped in 2012. Why? Brace said he and the Crown were close to reaching a deal that would have avoided a trial, but that higher-ups in the prosecution office decided they wanted to see if they could get Boleg declared a dangerous offender. Brace said he was told, we don't care if Boleg pleads guilty or is found guilty. We want to send him to jail for life. Brace said given that, he had no choice but to go to trial. He said, we make no bones about the impact this has had on these women. It's horrific. But Brace said dangerous offenders can have hundreds of pages on their criminal record, and that until his convictions for the rapes, Boleg had none. Brace argued that what Boleg did was not a pattern, but a cluster. Brace noted that there were margins of error in tests to assess Boleg. He says those margins of error were interpreted to make him a high risk to reoffend, but they could easily have been interpreted to make him a low risk. Brace says Boleg should get 10 years in prison. Boleg has already been in custody for five years. With credit for time served, Brace says that leaves about two and a half left. Boleg will be sentenced November 9th. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. The RNC has issued a public advisory about a man with a long criminal record who is now living in St. John's. 
Police have reasonable grounds to believe that Barry Edward Sinclair will commit a violent crime against a woman. The advisory came out within the last hour. It follows a CBC Investigate story from earlier this week. You know, we told you that the RNC have gone to court to get a type of peace bond against Sinclair because they believe he will commit a crime. The police are reminding members of the public to keep home security in mind, to lock their doors and windows, and and report any suspicious activity to Crime Stoppers. Marine Atlantic is warning customers that ferry crossings between Port of Basque and North Sydney could take longer in the coming weeks. Now that's because of efforts to protect endangered North Atlantic right whales. The federal government has ordered all large vessels in the Gulf of St. Lawrence to slow to 10 knots following the deaths of right whales. Marine Atlantic says it anticipates the same order will be applied to ships in the Cabot Strait sometime this fall. Well, believe it or not, there's lots of talk in recent days about a possible sighting of a panther on the West Coast. Obviously not an animal normally associated with our problems. No, not at all. And Provincial Wildlife says there's no evidence of a black panther roaming in the Deer Lake area. Rumors started from a Facebook post, a woman saying she saw a large cat with round ears and a thick rope-like tail. Another woman also said uh, she saw a similar animal in that area. Now, our radio colleagues at On The Go spoke with Gary Kane, a reporter at the Western Star in Cornerbrook. He says sightings like this have been around for some time. The last 10 years, several of them in Springdale, Portishaw, uh, Badger, uh, down around uh, Port of Basque in that area, uh, you know, all, and up the northern peninsula. I've heard one of the stories, the, the story goes that there were a couple of American hunters who were dropped off in the main river area on the northern peninsula who uh, released a couple of cat three, they say, according to the story. And then they were going to hunt them. They released them to hunt them. And uh, weather came in, and they didn't get to do the hunting, and they left. And apparently the, the animals would have been left behind, if, if that's true at all. Like this Again, the story is unconfirmed, so no one really knows. Now, another story I've heard just in the last couple of days was there was a – a circus coming through the province, and they a couple of animals escaped. Now that's the first I ever heard of that. I don't. I. I don't. I, I've never heard of that happening. So I don't know if there's any credence whatsoever to that that story. <laughs> Color me wow. skeptical. Yeah, on yeah. that one. Good yeah. stories, though. Great yeah. stories. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be amazing if they were true. But yeah. uh, so let's talk about something else that's a, a bit unbelievable right now. All of this wonderful warm weather. Yeah, and more to come. Temperatures on the rise uh, through the weekend, which is the good news. We're yeah. going to give you the little Coles Notes version of the forecast because I know uh, a lot of folks are wondering what it is shaping up like. Well, again, a couple of shower chances on the Avalon through tonight, but generally pretty quiet. Uh, and then we are looking at uh, Saturday, a great day on the island. Watch that cold front moving into Labrador. That will certainly increase the clouds. It's going to bring some showers into southern areas through the day, including the southeast. Uh, I think staying out of the straits, though, until the evening and overnight hours. Labrador City, chance of a flurry mixing to a shower. Showers in Happy Valley Goose Bay, but some clearing on the other side. Again, the island looks great on Saturday, but these showers even at times a little on the steady side will push through on Sunday. Periods of rain, uh, more uh, likely for the west coast of the island, the northern peninsula, and back across into Labrador, where uh, that's the best potential to see some of those heavier periods of rain. Now, by the time we get to Monday morning, uh, still some differing ideas on how quickly this front is going to be moving through, but it looks like we'll see showers in the morning. Central and eastern Newfoundland, I think this front will start to wander offshore into the afternoon. That will allow brightening skies for central and possibly even eastern Newfoundland, though it may take until mid to late afternoon by the time we start to see some of that sunshine. That will, of course, really uh, factor into our temperature, which I have right now at 19. But if those showers take a little bit longer to clear, it would be a bit cooler than that. If the showers clear earlier, we do have a shot at 20 degrees, but the best chance of 20 degrees right now on the island will be central Newfoundland and the northeast coast on Monday at 21. So you can see temperatures certainly warming through the weekend, and we'll have a, a better look and closer look at this, and we'll talk about next week, which is very interesting, it includes maybe the first uh, potential flurries on the island of the season. We'll talk about that coming up. Carolyn? Thanks, Ryan. 
Well, some Newfoundland outports are seeing a new trend. For decades, young people have left for larger centers and never looked back. But now, some are discovering that rural life is exactly what they're looking for. Chris O'Neill Yates set out to find out just why they're so attracted to rural Newfoundland life. The allure of the roughly hewn Newfoundland coastline. It was part of what brought John Norman, Bonavista's new mayor, back to his hometown. That and the opportunity he envisioned to buy up old buildings and renovate them. This is an 1880 sea captain's home. Norman now owns 50 heritage buildings and they're selling. I've helped move in 37 new residents just last year and the average age was 33. He says the magnet for millennials is lifestyle. There is this growing minority that they're dissatisfied with their life in these urban environments. You might want to have a slightly more affordable home, you might want a larger yard, you might want some chickens. Not just residential, but business properties are hot too. So we have three commercial buildings that'll be ready between now and next fall, and we have 11 companies that want to move in. Roger Dooling is one of the new business people who were drawn to Bonavista. We actually just moved here in July, so we just started, the kids started school. Um, so it's been, you know, fairly, a lot of changes, but good changes for us. Dooling and his wife started a line of skincare products using ingredients such as local flowers and iceberg water. Last year with the six new businesses on board, uh, it made it a lot easier for you to jump in and, and to expose yourself because you had a, someone else to back it up or someone else to support you down just two street or two houses down with another business. So it became very uh, family networking and just helping each other make this moment happen. Dooling serves the local tourist market, but he wants to expand his business internationally. The speed for me uh, is great. I don't need a lot of uh, things in my life to distract me, I guess. I, I need to be focused on our business, uh, and Bonavista kind of does that. Katie Hayes prepares her restaurant signature pizza. She went away and studied to be a chef. Now she and her husband Shane are raising three children here. We knew we wanted to live this type of lifestyle and raise our kids in this type of uh, setting. Shane worked for Dell and Microsoft in Ireland but wanted something different. To be so close to your food and, and for our, our, our children to, uh, to have that relationship with their food as well and obviously live in a, in a healthy environment with, with clean air. And they say business has exceeded their wildest expectations. Going well for us as we kind of are just showcasing what Newfoundlanders have always done. Alicia McDonald shovels grains out of a vat at Port Rexton Brewery. McDonald is from Nova Scotia and she's already worked in several microbreweries. Sonia and I had got married three years ago in this area in Trinity Bite and we just decided, hey, let's bring this little idea with us. Sonia Mills is a Newfoundlander who yearned to live back home in a rural community. I definitely think that it's a continued uh, momentum of younger people moving, returning to these communities or moving here having never grown up here. And you're getting a really nice mix of just that sort of drive, that uh, um, invigoration, I guess, uh, reinvigoration. In just a year, their microbrewery has become a roaring success. Well, right now we're supplying seven uh, bars and restaurants in St. John's and I think we've done the total now. We're up to 23 on a wait list trying to get our product. Mill says the trend toward a rural life is growing in popularity, as are the kinds of services that millennials themselves want. The food and beverage scene here, um, it's very advanced, it's very delicious. <laughs> um, there are so many options, you know, a lot of places are are already doing farm to table um, and you kind of can't go backwards from that I don't think. Sometimes you see some wildlife on the trail like moose and foxes. Marika Gao just took over her family's thriving inn and restaurant. For a long time I think people never quite understood what they had here. A tourist season that has stretched from two to six months helps make it work. Because there's more of these businesses here, uh, more people are actually being attracted to live here. Not just come here as tourists, but they are actually seeing this as a viable place to live. This place is a tourist magnet, and the kind of opportunity to make a decent living now exists here after years of hard work. What I do find, too, is younger operators 
we are very cooperative with each other. We're constantly talking to each other about the issues we face as uh, people running businesses, and we're all trying to work together to, uh, to move forward. Moving forward, not just to make a living, but to make a life. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Trinity. Up next, we'll tell you about new developments involving Indigenous people who were sent to residential schools and why the Prime Minister is travelling to Labrador in November. And later, we'll tell you about the unusual hobby of Ian Gillies and why it involves old iron spikes from the Newfoundland Railway. Welcome back. A date has been set for the long-awaited apology from the federal government to Indigenous people in this province. It's something survivors of residential schools in Newfoundland and Labrador have waited for decades. Last year, a class action lawsuit ended in a $50 million settlement for residential school survivors. Now, a lawyer who represented about 1,000 people here says Justin Trudeau will be in Happy Valley Goose Bay to apologize on November 24th. In 2008, then Prime Minister Stephen Harper excluded this province's Indigenous people from the apology he made to the rest of Canada's residential school survivors. 
In the meantime, the Supreme Court has ruled that thousands of sensitive records about abuses at residential school are confidential. It's a ruling that will see at least some of those records destroyed. Tom Perry has the story. This ruling covers 38,000 accounts of abuse at residential schools. Survivors told their stories as part of the federal government's 2006 compensation agreement with former students. The stories are very graphic, very detailed, and both victims and alleged abusers are named. The federal government and the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation argued these documents are of historic significance, that they must be preserved and archived so that future generations can know the full story of the residential school system. But some survivors, as well as the chief adjudicator who gathered their stories, took the position these stories had been told in confidence, with an understanding they would never be made public. Today, the court agreed. In their unanimous ruling, the judges said survivors and no one else should control their stories. Disclosing the information in these accounts, they said, could be devastating to survivors and their families. The court ruled the records should be kept for a period of 15 years. During that time, individual survivors can choose whether they want their records to be preserved and archived. After that, the court says all remaining records should be destroyed. The federal minister of Crown Indigenous Affairs, Carolyn Bennett, says she's disappointed by the ruling. The head of the independent assessment process, which collected the stories, says today's decision is a victory for survivors. Tom Perry, CBC News, Ottawa. And there's another major development involving Indigenous people tonight. The federal government has reached a compensation settlement with survivors of the 60th scoop. The Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, Carolyn Bennett, spoke today in Ottawa about the deal. The agreement in principle is an important first step on this journey of healing. Now we will work together on the path forward, including the words for an apology. I have great hope that because we've reached this plateau, that this again will never, ever happen in Canada. Thousands of Indigenous children were taken from their families and placed in non-Indigenous homes in the 60s, 70s and 80s. The loss of their language and culture was devastating for so many of the so-called so scooped children. Details must still be signed off in court. Both sides are still working on the wording of a formal apology, which could come in the spring. Labrador MP Vaughn Jones isn't sure how many of those survivors are from this province. She says the effect has been long-lasting. It has affected their own development. It has affected how they have been able to cope in society and raise their families. Um, you know, so I think for many of them, uh, this will come as um, something that is very deeply felt for them. I, I think uh, for most of them, um, it is going to be welcomed and it is needed as part of the healing process that they have to go through. Ryan had Thanksgiving weekend on his mind when he headed out to a local vegetable market today. Up next, he shows us the fruits of, or rather the vegetables of, his labor.
He's coming with information about the weather and also about vegetables. Mm -hmm. Bearing um, gifts. Bearing gifts, yes. <laughs> uh, so we went vegetable shopping uh, today, which was great at uh, the uh, Churchill Square with a little farmer's market set up there. Uh, so I'm going to ask you girls while we're eating or uh, while we're watching to have a little sample of the carrots that I brought and tell me whether you think it's uh, which one is local and which one is from the mainland. And Ooh, we'll see. Challenge. We'll te yeah. We'll test your test your uh, your <laughs> local taste buds. Okay. Okay. All right. So watch the while well, we watch the piece. Okay, we're here on this beautiful Friday afternoon with Jocelyn Fagan. Uh, how are you? I am good. Are you busy? Yes, very, very busy. Yeah, we waited till the line uh, shortened a little bit at least. What kind of a season has it been for you? A really good season. You know, June, May and June was cold, but yeah. stuff was behind. But July it picked up again. So you got lots and lots of uh, goodies for us here on Thanksgiving weekend. Is there anything in particular that you make sure you have more of for this weekend? Got to make sure you got lots of carrot. Carrot is your main seller. Yeah, carrot for the for Thanksgiving. You haven't got a carrot, there. Debbie's very disappointed. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, potatoes, obviously. Uh, oh, potatoes, carrot, turnip, cabbage. Uh, salt meat, everything for a Duke's dinner. I see you have the salt meat out as well. Uh, yeah. Does that tend to be uh, more popular or less popular for Thanksgiving weekend? Oh, it's really popular for Thanksgiving. They got to have their salt meat with their Duke's dinner. Yeah. That's the, the beginning of the meal. Yeah. You start with your salt meat before, that's first thing goes in the pot. Of course. Right? Of course. How many years have you been set up here, do you know? Around 28. 28 years. What are you doing for Thanksgiving weekend? Oh, uh, well, I'm here tomorrow. I'm off Sunday, Monday, so I'll have my You can have thanks, your big crew. My Thanksgiving dinner, yeah. And you're doing your salt beef? And, oh, yes, yeah. and the whole meal deal. Good. All your nose. Good. Yeah. Well, I hope you have a great Thanksgiving weekend. Yeah, you and, too. And thanks for... And make sure you come and buy us your vegetables. Oh, you listen, know, like, absolutely. Get out of your fresh vegetables. Yeah, I'm going to grab some carrots here now and okay. uh, take them back for Debbie and Carolyn. Oh, okay, good. Nice. Good. Doesn't that look wonderful? Oh, wonderful. Yeah, I left with a bag full of goods. <laughs> no of course you that. would. Of yeah. course you would. And uh, also, I'm not sure whether Cal got it in the shots, but uh, uh, local, uh, obviously, fresh cooked bread that was cooked this morning. Oh, I was going to ask about that because oh. turkey sandwiches. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Seriously, that's, that's like one of the idea. best parts of turkey dinner. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you get to reap the rewards for days. Okay, so how'd you do? I guessed that this one was from the farmer's market. And uh, you told me I was right just That's while right. I was yeah. munching on it. it. It's a subtle difference, but it's really sweeter and juicier. That's mm. my analysis. You had a difficult, more difficult time. I did, I did. Now, I thought this was the farmer's market one because it was bigger and I... It, <laughs> Which is right. Yeah. yeah. But I had a hard time distinguishing the difference, uh, to be honest. And it was a really tough challenge because the other carrots are actually from Atlanta, Canada, but uh, not... Okay. From, pulled from the ground the last couple of days. So fresh. Yeah, yeah lovely. definitely. <laughs> anyway, uh, hopefully uh, you're going to enjoy the, uh, the, all the goods and the goodies of the weekend on your, uh, on your table. And uh, in terms of the weather, well, we've got a little bit of everything on the table this weekend. How about we start with the harvest moon? Uh, oh, speaking oh, of harvest, nice. what a shot. I'm not actually sure where Lisa took this picture, but it is uh, just a fantastic pick. Uh, there were so many that came into my Facebook page over the last couple of days. Uh, but, uh, yeah, really, really lovely. Thank you very much, Lisa, for sharing that. And the harvest moon led to a pretty nice day today as we've had temperatures in the, generally the mid, low to mid-teens for most of the island. Just 10 degrees in Cornerbrook with a bit of an onshore wind there. And we are looking at single digits right now in Labrador. And actually some wet flurries mixing in at last check in Labrador City. And that is the name of the game tonight and in through the early morning hours of Saturday. This is the trough line that's been working its way across the island. Nothing you know, really uh, uh, doom and gloom about this. Certainly a couple of showers, but uh, nothing to really affect your travel, which is good if you are hitting the roads over the next little bit. A couple of spotty showers out towards Bonavista and Trinity Bay. You can see with the latest uh, webcam shot from the Holyrood station, definitely some traffic on the go with uh, folks heading out around the cabin or out around the bay. Uh, you can see a little trailer in that shot there, 15 degrees, but Mostly cloudy skies and again, a couple of showers, but nothing too significant to worry about if you have travel plans 
tonight or if you're hitting the road early tomorrow morning from St. John's and or from the west and heading east and no matter where you are traveling tomorrow morning, it looks pretty uh, much smooth sailing across the island. Just make sure you remember the sunglasses uh, for Labrador. Again, flurry chances in west and up towards the north, but uh, pretty quiet. Happy Valley Goose Bay and into the southeast. Now, as so we work throughout the day tomorrow, a bit of cloud cover kicking up from time to time, but very, very nice day on the island. Winds in from the west southwest. We are watching this uh, front that's going to be moving in through Labrador. That will bring some shower chances to Happy Valley Goose Bay in the southeast. And then our rain moves in for Sunday, so we'll all take advantage of Saturday. Certainly uh, six degrees, mainly sunny skies here in St. John's. We'll get up to 15 into the afternoon under still mostly sunny skies. A few clouds into the evening. Boy, how about that sunset? 627. Is it there already? As uh, yes, the days get shorter and shorter. We'll want to make sure we get out and appreciate days like this that are going to be very lovely. A little bit cooler in those onshore winds along the south coast. Expect a bit of cloud cover to kick up into the afternoon along the west coast with winds gusting upwards of 40 to 50 kilometers per hour. And again, those that front moves southward, so I do think we'll see a bit of a break into the afternoon name. Labrador City Churchill Falls, just mainly cloudy skies. Uh, those showers will actually clear out of Cartwright and Happy Valley Goose Bay late afternoon, and it's increasing clouds and showers into the afternoon for uh, Mary's Harbor and down into the Straits. As we uh, take a look at your forecast over the next uh, couple of days, we'll talk about that seven day, which uh, definitely has some interesting weather involved there. We'll talk about that coming up. This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. Up next, on the run, we tag along as some young cross-country runners end their season with a final race. Welcome back to Here and Now. Hundreds of runners will take part in the final cross-country running series tomorrow in St. John's. The program has been pushing students to try out the sport for 25 years. Here Now's Jeremy Eaton took in the race last weekend. Ah! Riley, stay with me. 25 years ago, we were looking to uh, promote the sport. Uh, we were looking to get more kids involved in their running. At the time, we only had one race, uh, and we felt that we can do something. So we wanted to work with the other uh, sports, 
and uh, we wanted to start early in the school season so that's why the races are fixed the last two Saturdays of September and the first Saturday of October so to allow other sports uh, to use this event to develop some fitness and uh, building some team. On average these days uh, we are about 800 plus to 900 kids every every Saturday for the three Saturdays so we're very fortunate. The event has been very popular over the years. How hard is it to run around two laps of this field here? Harder than it looks. I think it's good for exercise and instead of like going home on your iPad. Yes, the plan is to keep it going as long as we can. We have a great support from the teachers. Uh, the teachers have bought in. I'm talking about the physio teachers. Uh, the school program have bought into the program. That's why it's so successful. Everybody is looking forward to those events to start the school year. Our co-workers at CBC Radio Crosstalk spent the noon hour broadcasting live from Benita's Kitchen in Spaniards Bay. She uses social media to teach people how to cook yummy traditional Newfoundland meals. Including some of the best ways to cook moose meat or prepare a dish of moose stroganoff. Something tells me uh, host Cecil Hare and his technical crew had a delicious time. Let's meet our young athlete of today. We'd like to introduce you to Nicholas Abrard of Puchko. Nicholas is seven years old and is pictured here after completing the Kids of Steel Triathlon. Nicholas also enjoys curling, baseball, and soccer. Awesome job, Nicholas. You're today's young athlete of the day. Well, Ian Gillis is so hooked on blacksmithing that he has built two forges of his own, one at his home in Conception Bay South and the other in Brigus South. Gillis turns old iron spikes from the former Newfoundland Railway into hunting knives and cheese knives. And that's the focus of this week's What Are You At? feature. This is my forge. I think it started in a, a fire pit in the backyard with my son and he would put metal in there and he didn't believe it got red hot as it did and he would beat on it. That sparked the interest and just grew and grew. 
I found a guy and I bought a hundred railroad spikes from him. Rusty old Newfoundland railroad spikes. And just turning for going from spike into a knife. So I was mainly making like a hunting knife and a cheese knife. But that's the only knife I make, so I'm not a, a bladesmith. I'm, I'm more about the heating the metal and beating on the metal and, you know, manipulating the metal. I love the idea of taking something, making something so that is delicate, but making it out of iron, you know. That's cool. Yeah, yeah nice. it was. So yeah. many great hobbies. Weekend AM uh, is uh, bringing all these stories. People mm. are at a they lot of things. <laughs> Uh, what are you at the weekend? Oh, I know what I'm at. <laughs> yeah, trying to get Big outside. Feed, turkey dinner. <laughs> yeah, and of course, Ditto. yeah, trying to get out and enjoy uh, some of that weather. Of course, we all will be trying to do that, and it's important that we do so because we're only going to get so many more of these nice warm temps. As we take a look at your weather on the way headlines, uh, have a look. We've got some sunshine on the way for Saturday for most of us. Uh, showers for Sunday. Monday, we're going to clear out and temperatures are really on the rise Monday into Tuesday. But what goes up must come down. And that's where things get interesting in the seven day forecast. Here's how it plays out. Our first trough of the weekend uh, as the weekend kicks off. A few showers over eastern parts of Newfoundland for this evening will clear out. By the time we get to Saturday morning, we are looking at a bright day across the island. Uh, this front moving through Labrador will bring some showers chances with the cloud cover building in through Labrador. As we were, roll throughout uh, Saturday evening into the overnight, that front really starts to dissipate ahead of this next system coming in. So again, the island looking great on Saturday. 14, 15 degrees, mainly sunny skies. Uh, just five in Labrador City with flurries mixing over to showers. Happy Valley Goose Bay showers uh, moving through around midday with a possibility of some late day clearing. Nain again, some wet flurries mixing in there as well. So our next system builds in through Sunday. The bulk of the shower activity I think will be in the morning for western Newfoundland up into Labrador. That's where we'll have the best potential of seeing showers at times heavy. More of the scattered shower nature for central towards eastern parts of Newfoundland. I think that threat certainly moves in for the morning for central. More of a midday time period uh, threat for the uh, Avalon region, which continues into the afternoon as we still see the threat uh, of uh, some scattered showers in behind. Uh, temperatures in the 15, 16, 17 degree range in Labrador, anywhere from four in the north to 15 in the west. Now, as we take a look at your uh, uh, Monday setup, showers in the morning, central towards eastern Newfoundland, that front will be wandering east through the day. And so we should see some clearing into the afternoon and some sunshine appearing central, western Newfoundland, and yes, possibly even eastern Newfoundland. Labrador looks great on Monday. Temperatures anywhere from 6 in the north uh, to 16 in the south, looking at 20 potential uh, for basically Terra Nova, Gander towards Grand Falls, Windsor. Not far off that mark. I think in places like Cornerbrook and even St. John's in the metro region, we're going to be certainly into the high teens, uh, looking very nice. Now watch this. This is uh, the setup for next week. Tuesday looks quiet and another warm one. Here comes our system moving in. That will actually be possibly the remnants of a Nate in the tropics moving in, not really adding too much uh, uh, impact to the system, but certainly making it a little more impactful for us and bringing a little bit of extra rain. And then on the other side of the system, forecast models flirting with the potential for the first flurries of the season for the Northern Peninsula, possibly even the Bay Verde Peninsula and higher elevations of uh, Newfoundland. So we're going to be keeping an eye on that setup as we roll into next week. So a big cool down uh, for Wednesday and into Thursday on the other side of the system. But ahead of it, boy, temps again, high teens, low 20s, looking very, very nice indeed. And into Labrador, there's your seven day trend. Really, really nice Monday, Tuesday, big cool down for Wednesday. Staying with uh, weather related stories, Tropical Storm Nate is being blamed for at least 22 deaths in Central America. It's now spinning northward in the Gulf of Mexico. These are pictures from Costa Rica. Nate brought a heavy downpour causing widespread flooding and mudslides. The strong winds also knocked down trees. Nate is expected to pick up strength as it moves over warmer waters. Hurricane and tropical storm warnings have now been issued for three U.S. Gulf states. Well, there were some scary moments at a Toronto recycling plant overnight. A chemical spill sent five people to hospital with minor injuries after they experienced respiratory problems. 
Fire officials say workers were separating blue box material when they came into contact with an unknown substance. They say it may have been a mixture of household chemicals. Special decontamination showers were brought into the scene. 62 employees were scrubbed down by a special team of paramedics. U.S. President Donald Trump is keeping reporters guessing about a cliffhanger remark last night at a photo op with a group of military leaders. Trump wouldn't say if, quote, calm before the storm was about Iran or North Korea. When asked what he meant, he said, you'll find out. <laughs> Our beautiful, beautiful viewer picture of the day as we kick off Thanksgiving long weekend comes from central Newfoundland. This one just down the road from Lewisport. Pretty tough one in terms of location, but we'll uh, reveal after the break. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, it's the incredible power of Mother Nature witnessed in eastern China. Thousands of spectators gathered together today to watch the world's largest tidal bores. The incoming waves crashed into the river's embankment with serious force. The tidal bore on this particular river is world famous. The phenomenon is caused by the gravitational pull of the moon. Interesting. It is really uh, magical in a way. It is, yeah. And it is time now to find out who's celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. Just have a look. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Tony and Irene Ryan of Arnold's Cove, who are celebrating today. Also celebrating today, Regina Gullidge is 90 years old. She's from the curling area of Corner Brook and is now at a retirement home in the Bay of Islands. Happy 71st anniversary wishes to Annie and Ted Buckle. Happy 93rd birthday coming up next Tuesday to Mary Elliott of Mainbrook. Happy 50th anniversary to Ernie and Shirley Kosh of Fogo. It's a 90th birthday for Ellen Glavine of Bishop's Falls. 
Happy 50th anniversary tomorrow to Elvia and Harvey King of Perry's Cove. And it's a golden anniversary as well for Vic and Linda Barrett of Upper Island Cove. Happy birthday to Martin Ryan from Stephenville, who will be 90 years old tomorrow. Congratulations today to Doris and Naaman Moland of Mount Pearl, who are celebrating their 62nd wedding anniversary. Happy birthday to Jane Dooley of Sweet Bay, who turns 95 this Sunday. Happy 53rd wedding anniversary to Bill and Isabel Oliver of St. John's. Happy 92nd birthday to Genevieve Turpin, formerly of St. Lawrence, now residing in Brampton, Ontario. Happy 95th birthday wishes to Josie Hillier of Greens Harbor, Trinity Bay. Frederick Johnson turned 93 this week. He's originally from Little Catalina and is now at the Caribou Memorial Veterans Pavilion in St. John's. Happy 65th wedding anniversary wishes to Garfield and Honor Hounsel of Wareham. Happy 90th birthday to Olga Barnes, formerly of Topsail, now in Paradise. Happy birthday to Phyllis Sullivan of Pooch Cove, who celebrated her 92nd birthday yesterday. Happy 90th birthday to Ralph Humber of Cornerbrook. Wishing Clarence and Barbara Billard best wishes on their 55th wedding anniversary today. Happy 62nd anniversary to Dawn and Shirley Boone of Bishop's Falls celebrating today. Happy anniversary to Irma and Sterling Freak from Appleton celebrating 64 years of marriage. Happy 91st birthday to George Coombs of Upper Island Cove. It's a golden wedding anniversary coming up on Monday for Edmund and Rita Walburn of Fogo. Happy birthday to Merida Rex of Cornerbrook, who celebrated her 90th birthday yesterday. And a big happy birthday coming up on the 17th for Fred LeDru of Bay Roberts, who will be 100 years old. Happy 98th birthday today to Clementine Luther Butt of Bishop's Falls. She still lives in her own home, and we're told she loves to knit. Happy birthday to Alma Miles of Garnish, also celebrating today. She's 93 years old. Happy 92nd birthday greetings yesterday to Susie Noseworthy of Pooch Cove. Her family says she enjoys watching here and now every evening, and we're very glad to know she does. <laughs> October 7th, Frank and Susie Young of Beachside will be celebrating their 63rd anniversary, and they'll be having a time at the Springdale Retirement Center where they now live. And happy 50th wedding anniversary to Ross and Betty Pilgrim tomorrow. They are formerly from St. Anthony and now living in St. John's. All right, our viewer picture of the day comes to us from Gwen. And she snapped this picture just before the turnoff towards Lewisport along the Trans-Canada Highway, Indian Arm Pond, and a beautiful picture. Wow. That just shows uh, uh, what an amazing sunset, the sky, there's so much going on, the reflection in the pond, just a gorgeous well, picture. And the way she's got it framed with uh, the greenery in front, it is a beautiful picture, Very Gwen, nice. thank you. Warm and cool colors, just yes. gorgeous. <laughs> Now, before, uh, before we leave you tonight, uh, we just want to make one note about Monday. It's the uh, Thanksgiving Day holiday, of course. So uh, we'll have a half hour edition of Here and Now. It starts at a regular time at 6. The host is Peter Cowan. And following Here and Now, we'll have a 30 minute music special uh, called the Parkway Sessions. Here's a look at what to expect. Have a great weekend and good night. Good, good night, night, everyone.